All right, this is the last lecture of Chapter 5, Burge. Uh, the focus today is on Hess's Law, both the direct and indirect method, and uh, enthalpies of formation. All right, enthalpy is a state function. So, uh, again, if you think of um, if you think of energy or heat, and we flow from here to here, um, then the enthalpy change for an exothermic reaction. This is where the energy would be at the beginning of the reaction, and this is where the energy would end up at the end of the reaction, and the final minus the initial. Um, would give us a negative value. So, so think of something like if this was a 6 and this was a 1. Uh, 1 minus 6 would give us a negative 5, and that would be an enthalpy change of negative 5. And remember, negative means exothermic. And uh, so, again, we're in lower energy state than what we started with, and so that energy released was 5, and usually it's in kilojoules per mole. So regardless of the path, where whether it went in one fell swoop or it actually went down and then back up and then we went to a higher energy level and then we went down here to another lower energy level, if we end up in the same ending, the same place, right, the delta H will be the same regardless of path. When we add up all of these, that would be an endothermic process here. Then it would be exothermic down to here. Then we'd have another endothermic process. And then we'd have another exothermic process. And when we add these all up, it would still come out to be negative 5. So that's what we mean by state function, that the function, or in this case enthalpy, the property here, is that it's going to be the same regardless of path. All right? So it doesn't matter whether we measure it directly, like this way, or we measure it indirectly through this series of steps here, um, the change in enthalpy will be the same. And you go, well, why do I need to know this? Well, many reactions are too fast to measure the enthalpy. Uh, think of an explosive reaction. Uh, all the heat's released in a matter of a microsecond, like we talked about um, the airbag. Uh, you know, once you collide with something within microseconds, it uh, ignites, forms of gases, fills up your airbag before your body even comes close to hitting the steering wheel. So for something like that, it would be very difficult to measure directly. Uh, the heat would dissipate quickly, um, and it happens so fast we don't have sensors maybe that can collect the data. So. Uh, knowing that enthalpy is a state function and that it's pathway independent, we can do a series of slower steps, and when we add them together, we can determine the enthalpy of the reaction as well, like we see with this alternative here where we're going through multiple steps to get to the same endpoint. So, the best way to think about Hess's law, this is going to be the indirect method. And again, we're doing it through a series of steps. Think of it like a puzzle. That's the best way to solve these problems. All right. So here's what the puzzle is. They want to know what the enthalpy of this reaction is. What is the enthalpy change? Okay. And you have these reactions to go by. Notice none of these reactions are this final reaction here. So what you're going to do is manipulate reaction 1, 2, and 3 so that when you add these three reactions together, you get this reaction. We'll call it, the, uh, we'll call it reaction number 4 if you want to. That's fine. All right, so you go, well, how am I supposed to do this? Well, you look at... In the final reaction, you see that nitric oxide is a reactant. 
Well, the only equation of these three, one, two, and three, that have nitric oxide is the first equation. And it's on the reactant side, and that's where we need it to be in our final or, uh, reaction number four. So that gives us a clue that we're not really going to do anything to reaction number one. We're going to leave it as is. Why? Because nitric oxide is a reactant on the reaction one. It's also a reactant in reaction four. And we only need one mole of nitric oxide. And there's only one mole of nitric oxide here in our final reaction or reaction four. So we're going to leave it as is. So the next thing is, you notice there's no ozone, there's no ozone, and there's no o oxygen in our final reaction like O2. There's a singlet oxygen, but there's not uh, a diatomic oxygen. So the question is, what do we need to do to these two reactions so that when you add it to this one, the ozone disappears and we're left with only monoatomic oxygen? So, because this reaction is the only reaction that has ozone in it, other than the first reaction, and we're not going to change this reaction at all, we're going to leave it fixed because the nitric oxide is in the correct place, we need to flip this reaction. We need to flip this reaction and say that it's 3 halves O2 yields ozone. And yes, you should put the phases of matter, but for demonstration purposes, I'm not going to do that. And what you know what happens if you've looked at the last lesson, you know that when you flip the reaction, the sign changes. So if it was exothermic in this direction, the reverse of that reaction would be endothermic. So we make this a positive 1423. Now you may be saying, well, how do you need to multiply that by anything? No, because look, this ozone on the product side, that's one mole of ozone here, will now cancel out with this ozone up here in our first reaction. And it's one to one, so they completely cancel out. Now, this hasn't canceled out. We still have three halves oxygen to deal with. All right, so the next thing is we're going to focus on is we notice in this equation there is oxygen as a product diatomic oxygen, there's no diatomic oxygen in our final reaction. And we also have oxygen that we just created when we flip this equation over to this side. Alright, so you know that 3 has oxygen is one and a half oxygen and um, you have one oxygen here and you have 3 has oxygen here and now you have one oxygen here. So right now what we have, when we look at all three equations at the top, we have one oxygen here as a reactant, we have three halves oxygen here, which is one and a half, so we've got two and a half oxygen, and then here we have only one oxygen on the product side. So we would subtract one from two and a half, and uh, we would get one and a half oxygen. Well. That's not working for us because the oxygen, the O2, has to completely cancel out. So we don't want to change this equation at all. And the reason why we don't want to change this equation is there was only one ozone here, and that's been canceled out by this ozone here. So this equation number two is fixed. We're not going to change anything more about it. So the next thing we need to do then is if we have three halves oxygen here, which is one and a half oxygens, on the reactant side, and we have one oxygen on the product side in reaction number one, then I need to multiply this entire equation by one half. And you go, why did you do that? Well, that's going to give me one half oxygen, which is going to be equal to one um, ozone, I mean one monoatomic oxygen. And that's not a good guess. That's actually going to be a problem, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So that's not what we need to do here. We've got to think about this a little more. And the reason why it tells me, no, we got to do something with this problem is notice the monoatomic oxygen is on the product side. And we need it 
on the reactant side. All right, so let's try something else. Let's say we just flip the third one. We get two oxygen yields uh, an O2, like so. Okay. So if we do that, and we only need one, we know this equation has to be multiplied by one half. And so multiplying this equation by one half, we would get a monoatomic oxygen yields um, one half O2. Okay, so we flip the equation and we multiply it by one half. So that's going to make this negative one half times 495. And since we flipped the equation, it would be negative now, negative 495 kilojoules per mole. All right, so this one half will combine with this one up here, which is the same as three halves, and that will cancel out with this three halves right here. So I know this looks messy. Hopefully they show it in steps two, but that's the process. And again, you're not going to get it right the first time. I didn't either, but I keep trying. And what was the, uh, the clue here is the final equation has monoatomic oxygen. The only equation that has monoatomic oxygen is this equation, and it has to be flipped to get over here to the reactant side so it can come down to... Uh, when we add them all together, we get monoatomic oxygen on the um, reactant side. So that's the process, and let's look at how they do it. So it says arrange the given thermochemical equation so that they that this, they sum to the desired equation. That's what we're doing. Adding the three equations to get the fourth equation. Make the corresponding changes to the enthalpy changes and add them to get the desired enthalpy change. So in order to do this correctly, you have to watch the previous video that talked about thermochemical equations and what we can do to manipulate those equations. Like if we multiply by one half, we multiply every coefficient in the reaction by one half, and we also multiply the delta H by one half. All right, so let's look at what they did here. They left the first equation as is, and that's why it's a negative 198.9. They didn't change anything about this equation. For the second equation, they flipped it. That changed the sign here. And by flipping it, it allows that ozone to be canceled out with that ozone. All right? And then the last one, they flipped it, and they multiplied by one half. So if they flip it, that changes the sign to this negative value, and then they multiplied it by one half, and that's why it's negative 247.5 instead of negative uh, four, what is that, 455 or something like that? Oh, that's not good. Let's see, 247 and 247 is, uh, well, let's do that, 248, two, I should be able to do that with 247, doubled is uh, 494 plus 1, 495. All right, let's just check to make sure that's the case. Yeah, it was 495 positive. They flipped it, and then they also changed this, and then they multiplied by one half. So that's why it's a negative 247.5. So the reason why they did this, again, this one half O2 here, and if you have a one here, that's the same thing as two over two, right? You can think of this as the fraction two over two. If you add two over two to one over two, you get three over two, which is this right here. So this one half plus this one or three half, uh, you know, one and one plus one half is three halves, cancels out with this three halves on the reactant side. So you can't have a substance on both sides of the chemical yield sign. So the ozone subtracts off from the product side, subtracts one to one off with the ozone on the reactant side. And then this one oxygen and this half oxygen makes three halves oxygen. These two 
cancel out with this ozone, I mean this oxygen on the reactant side. So when we add this together, we get NO, that was still here, bring it down here. We get monatomic oxygen, it goes right there. We get nitrogen dioxide, it goes right there. And then everything else is canceled out. And if we did it correctly, when we add up all of these changes in enthalpy, we get the enthalpy change for our final reaction. This is Hess's law. It's an indirect method. We didn't do it in one step. We didn't go from NO plus whatever and then shoot down to um, NO plus monoatomic oxygen. It wasn't a direct step like this. We went through these three steps. Could have been something that, in fact, if you look at this, you started here, you drop down to negative 198, so we'll say something like here. So the first step was there. Then you went up to 142, so you add 142 and you end up here somewhere. And then you drop 247, which puts you to here, where we end up. And so when we add this all up, it went, the, the indirect method was here to here to here. The total change in enthalpy was negative 304 kilojoules per mole. Which, if you, would, if you could have measured directly from here to here, you would have got the same value for delta H. So that's called the Hess's Law indirect method. We will come back to this. I'll show you another example here in a minute. But, but the next slide talks about what are standard enthalpies of formation. So again, there's no absolute way to talk about what delta H is, or there's no way to determine H, right? So this is kind of like how much heat is contained in an atom or a compound without ever investigating. So we don't have a point where H is equal to zero. We don't have an absolute heat for a substance. So all we can do is measure changes in H. So once I burn whatever, let's say I got a piece of wood here, I don't know how much heat's in that wood. Now once I burn it and it starts to convert to, you know, it's on fire and it's converting to carbon dioxide and water, I can measure is it exothermic and I can also measure how much heat's given off. Maybe it's, uh, we'll say, 600 kilojoules per mole. So what are standard enthalpies of formation? Well, we have to have a reference point, a reference point where delta H is equal to zero. And again, we've talked about this before in the previous one. It's like, how do we judge what zero height is in this world? Well, it's not the lowest point on Earth because you could go to the Marianas Trench and go to the very bottom of the sea, and that would be the lowest point if that's the lowest trench uh, level, and I'm not positive, but I'm going to say it is. It's in the Pacific Ocean, right? So if that's zero, everything else above that's a positive value. But that's not what we do. The top of the sea or water is like this, and we make that the zero point. And you go, why do you make the sea the zero point? Because when you take a tube of water and you fill it full of water, it levels out at a particular level here. That's zero. All right, and then we start adding water. Uh, you know, water will level out. We usually use that as a reference point. Okay, so for mountains and everything, we, we, we say sea level is zero. So that if the mountain's up here, we reference to that point, and now that's the height of the mountain. Where the, mount, the mountain would be much higher if we reference from the, the lowest point on the earth. So we have to have an arbitrary point as what the zero value is. And we have to do that for delta H either since we can't determine, again, how much heat's in an object. So that's pretty much what this slide says. Let's go on to the next one. All right, so chemists have agreed what the arbitrary reference point's going to be for enthalpy. The standard enthalpy of formation and that's the symbol you need to know it. Why? Here's the standard symbol right there. F subscript means formation. Is defined as the heat change that results when one mole of a compound is formed from its constituent elements in their standard states. 
You go, what does that mean? Well, that means this. Uh, if I make one mole of water, H2O, in its standard state at 20, uh, at, uh, it doesn't say what temperature, so we'll just say H2O, H2O here. So what we have is we have H2 gas. That's normally how hydrogen is found in nature. We're going to react that with oxygen diatomic gas, which is the way oxygen is found in nature. We get water, right? Now, we can only have one mole of compound formed from its constituent elements in their standard state. Well, that's the constituent elements. Their standard state is diatomic and they're gaseous. And so to make this a bounce chemical equation, we have to multiply by a coefficient of one half here because we need two hydrogen and one oxygen to make one mole of water. So what we're saying here is I don't the delta H of this a formation, the standard enthalpy of formation of this is going to be arbitrarily assigned to zero. Any element in its standard state will always have a delta H of formation equal to zero. So this oxygen, that's its standard state, uh, O2 as a gas. So we say any heat that's generated by this reaction is equal to the formation of this only. Right? So that's what's cool about this is that if this is the reference point, that this is given a zero value and this is given a standard enthalpy of formation value of zero, any heat gained or lost in this reaction, we solely apply it to the H2O liquid. So we're going to see some examples of this, but let me show you the general equation at first. So the general equation is we have reactant A plus B forms C and D. So we take the, let's think about this. We already know that delta H is equal to H final minus H initial or H products minus H reactants. So notice our product C, here it is. That's its um, moles, how many, or how much, how many moles of, um, of, uh, or let's do it this way. This is the standard enthalpy of formation of C, and we'd look that up in a table times the number of moles of C we have, and then we would look up the standard enthalpy of formation of D. We multiply that by how many moles we have, and we would sum this up. So in the brackets, these are all the products. You would add these up and you would get a number here for what's in the brackets here. And then we're going to subtract to, from them whatever the, the uh, enthalpies of formation are for the reactant. So notice A is a reactant, B is a reactant. We find the standard enthalpies of formation in a table in the back of the book and we multiply those by the number of moles we have. Now, instead of writing this all out, math mathematicians like a way to compactly write this. So, standard enthalpy of reaction, standard heat of reaction, if you want to call it that, or standard enthalpy change of the reaction is the way we would speak this, is equal to the summation. There's the summation part. The sigma represents summation of the number of moles, the standard enthalpy of formation of the products, minus the summation, that's what's all in the brackets here, the standard enthalpy of formation of the reactants. Okay? It's not hard. It's actually, these are some of the easier problems we do in this chapter. It's products minus reactants. Find the standard enthalpy of formations, multiply by the number of moles of each you have, and make sure you sum up the products, sum up the reactants, and subtract the product from the reactants. It's real easy. This is called the direct method of Hess's law, the direct method. Now, I think why students struggle with this is you do have to open your book and you have to look in Appendix 2. And Appendix 2 in your book, and you can look that up electronically as well, it's at the end, uh, will give you the standard enthalpy of formations, the entropies, and it will also give you the Gibbs free energies. We're focused on enthalpy only in Chapter 5. So, you have a balanced chemical equation, that's what you start with, 
and with the phases, it's important that you include the phases. This is like a thermochemical equation, right? So it needs to be balanced with phases, and we're actually tasked to find out what the delta H of this reaction is, all right? So we look up in our table the standard enthalpy of formation of the silver ion aqueous, the chloride ion aqueous, and the silver chloride solid. And here they are. Now, again, we got a problem here. There's a typo on this. This is actually um, positive 105.9 kilojoules per mole. This is negative 167.2 kilojoules per mole. And this is negative 127.0 kilojoules per mole. So these twos here are typos. They should be negative values. And the one here should be a positive value. So again, this makes this really confusing. If we were in class, we'd easily have corrected that. And some of you probably have worked ahead and said, this isn't working out right. So that's the problem. It's a typo. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Well, it's products. It's the, uh, the delta H of this reaction, the standard enthalpy or the standard heat of this reaction would be the, sil the number of moles of silver chloride, which is one, so we don't write it down. So we're going to need the Let's do it this way. We need the standard enthalpy. Uh, we need the standard enthalpy of formation of silver chloride. That's our only product. So we close the bracket off after we finish the product. Minus. We only have one mole of silver ion. So the standard enthalpy of formation of the silver ion. And here's where the summation comes in. Plus the standard enthalpy of formation of the chloride ion. In brackets. So if we plug these numbers in, uh, let's see, the last number was this one. So we would plug this in for the silver chloride, and this would go in for the silver ion, and this one here would go in for the chloride ion. If we plug those into this equation, we will determine the standard enthalpy of reaction. So here we go. Uh, we have, again, Here's our product. They didn't put a bracket here because you only have one product. But there's the standard enthalpy of formation of silver chloride. Minus the reactants. All right. And since they're all one to one here, we just need to find the standard enthalpy of formation of the reactants. There's the silver ion. There's the chloride ion that was given in the problem. Again, if they don't give these, you look in the back of the book. So here's why I find students make a mistake. If you take your calculator and go minus 127, minus 105.9, plus negative 167.2, you'll get the wrong answer. So the first thing you want to do is you want to add the standard enthalpy and formation of the silver ion with the chloride ion and get your number here. And now we're using parentheses, but this is what was in the brackets, all right? Make sure you do that step. Don't rush it because now it is this negative 127 minus a negative 61.3. And remember, minus a negative is a positive, and that's why this comes out to be negative 65.7. So don't rush it. Add up what's in the bracket. This one we didn't have to because we only had one thing as a product. But here, make sure you add this all up and get this number here before you do the operation to get to the answer. The other thing to be careful about, make sure everything's in kilojoules per mole. You can't add or subtract uh, terms that don't have the same unit. So make sure they're all in kilojoules per mole or you'll get the wrong answer. All right, these are not bad. This is called direct method. Direct Hess's law. And what it requires is you to look at the appendix 2 and find out your delta standard enthalpies of formation of each substance. And know that the standard enthalpy of formation of an element in its standard state, the standard enthalpy of formation is zero. And you'll see that in the table as well. Um, 
But, and again, you go, why aren't there any zeros here? Well, that's not the standard formation. That's not the way silver occurs in nature. It's silver. If it was AG solid, then the standard enthalpy of formation would be zero. That's not, not the way chlorine's naturally occurring in nature. It's chlorine diatomic as a gas. That standard enthalpy of formation would be equal to zero. But these are not their standard states. Therefore, they do have standard enthalpy of formation values. That's an easy method. This is easy, right? I mean, it's just addition and subtraction. It's not even mole to mole ratio or anything like that. So these are not that bad. You just got to be meticulous in your work. Do it step by step. Don't rush it. Where I see students again, they'll get to this point here and then like they won't take the time to sum or sum, uh, do a summation of what's in the bracket and they get the wrong answer. That's where I see the biggest mistake. All right, so here's Hess's law, the indirect method. Okay. So here's why students miss this problem. It says, given the following information, calculate the standard enthalpy of formation of acetylene from its constituent elements. So these are your equations, and what you're trying to get to is this equation. Carbon, how does carbon naturally occur in nature? It occurs as carbon, it occurs as a solid, and its particular form that it occurs in is graphite, not diamond. So you have to look at carbon graphite. That's its element. And then you got to look at hydrogen, which naturally occurs as a diatomic gas. And that forms one mole of compound, which is acetylene which is a gas at room temperature. So to balance this chemical equation, I need two moles of carbon, reacts with one mole of diatomic hydrogen to form one mole of acetylene. Now remember what the definition is of uh, standard enthalpy of formation is. Standard enthalpy of formation for a compound is that we have the constituent elements, carbon and hydrogen, they combine to form one mole of the compound in its standard state. And that's what we have here. So you are in charge of manipulating these three equations so that when you add them together, you get this equation. Okay, so what I would tell you to do here is stop the video and get some paper out and talk about how you're going to manipulate these three equations so that when you add these three equations together, you get this final equation. And every time you manipulate one of these equations, remember it changes the enthalpy for that equation. And when you add these three together after the manipulation, you will get the standard enthalpy formation of acetylene. You'll get a value here. All right. So stop. Think about how you're going to manipulate them. Try to do it the best you can and then let's see where you're making a mistake. All right. So Looking at the first equation, here's what's going to clue you in on the first equation. This is the only place that graphite carbon is available. And you need graphite carbon in the final equation to be on the reactant side, and you need two moles of it. So that tells me I need to multiply this entire equation by two. That's what that tells me. So that I will have the two moles of graphite to come down to uh, be in the final equation on the reactant side and two moles of it. All right, the next equation, this is the only place we have diatomic hydrogen. No diatomic hydrogen here, and I need one mole of diatomic hydrogen on the reactant side. So I have one mole of diatomic hydrogen here, and it's on the reactant side. I'm going to leave this equation as is. I'm not going to do a thing with it. Because I need that hydrogen to come down right there. Once I multiply this one by two, that one's going to come right there. 
Now, the next thing I need, I need everything to cancel out except the acetylene. And I don't need two moles of acetylene. I only need one mole of acetylene. So what does this tell me? Well, first of all, the acetylene's on the wrong side. It's on the reactant side. I need it on the product side of my final equation here. So that tells me I need to flip it. All right, so that's going to give me... Let me erase some of this so we've got some space. And let's change the pin color since we're going to try something different there. All right. So I'm going to flip it, so that would mean 4 moles of CO2. Oh, I thought I changed the pin color. All right. And I'm going to not write the units. I mean, the, the um, I'm not writing the phases, which you shouldn't be that sloppy. But again, just to write it. And again, I guess if you're doing it on an exam, you probably write it this quick too, because you're just trying to get to the question, right? So when I flip it, this becomes a positive 2598.8 kilojoules per mole. The sign changes. Now, I don't need two moles. I need one mole. So that tells me I need to take this entire equation and I need to multiply it by one half. So that's going to give me two carbon dioxide plus a water yields one acetylene plus five has oxygen. And it's going to make one half of 2598.8. All right, so what does that equal? One half of 2598.8 divided by two is 1299.4. So that's now my new delta H for the reaction. All right. So that's our plan. That's what we're going to do, and they're going to show us a better slide, too. So let's go on. Talked about that. Okay. So notice the first equation, they didn't do anything to it. Uh, or they, um, or let's go back. Did they multiply that one by two? I'm a little lost here what I did. All right. So the first equation, we multiply by two. Yes, I said that. Here it is. We multiply by two. Okay. The second equation, we don't do anything to it, stays the same. And the third equation, we flipped it, and we multiplied by one half, and yes, that's what we got for our value there. So watch what happens. This carbon comes straight down now to there. Um, this O2, let's focus on the O2. While we're, this is generally the last thing I focus on, but we'll go on and do it. So you have two oxygens two moles of oxygen on the reactant side plus a half mole of oxygen on the reactant side. So that's two and a half moles of oxygen. And on the product side, the only place you see oxygen is here, and that's five half moles of oxygen. Well, you've had enough math that you know this is called a mixed fraction, and you need to make it an improper fraction, so you say two times two plus one. That's five divided by two. So I have five moles of five and a half moles of oxygen on the reactant side, five and a half moles of rea uh, oxygen on the product side. They cancel each other out. So this one and this one cancel that one out. All right. I have two moles of CO2 on the product side here. I have two moles of CO2 on the reactant side here. They cancel each other out. I have one mole of water here, and I have one mole on the product side, and I have one mole of water on the reactant side here. They cancel each other out. So the hydrogen has not been canceled out. It goes right there. And the acetylene here hasn't been canceled out, so it goes right there. Everything else is accounted for. So that's called Hess's Law, the indirect method. And we use it when we have standard enthalpies of reaction for multiple reactions could be two or three or four and we manipulate these reactions so that when we add them together we get our final equation and the best way you get good at this is lots of practice and the best thing to do is a little at a time don't try to do ten of these at one setting maybe one maybe two at the most and treat it like a puzzle these are your puzzle pieces I mean, really, 
it is. It's it's not that hard to do if you go back and go, okay, here are my puzzle pieces. And let's just erase all of that. So here's what I have to work with. And then where students really miss this is right here. You have to write the equation here. Carbon graphite reacts with diatomic hydrogen in the gas phase. And according to standard enthalpy of formation, you form one mole of gas. So to make this work, I have to have two moles of carbon here. I leave the hydrogen as is because it's two on two on both, because this is one mole of the settling. So the here's your puzzle pieces. Manipulate these three pieces so that you get this equation as your final equation. Any changes or manipulations you do have to account both in the reaction or the balanced chemical equation and the delta H. So again, if we multiply the entire equation by two, you have to multiply the delta H by two as well. So I hope that helps. I hope you'll practice those. These are not as hard of problems as what we've been dealing with. You can score very well on both the materials for chapter five and the exam for chapter five and pull your grade up. And you need to understand this information to do well in Chem 180. And that's why we put energy at the end of Chem 170 because between stoichiometry and this, that's what you're going to use the most of in Chem 180 to be successful. It's not the quantum mechanical stuff. It's the stoichiometry. It's this. It's the naming. If you haven't got the naming down with the polyatomic ions, that's where you're going to have some problems. All right, and that's the end. Uh, the next is just an appendix. We've already talked about these slides. These are um, just some add-ons at the end. So that's the end of Chapter 5. If you have questions, email me. Um, I would encourage you to watch these videos sooner rather than later. Um, be able to answer the LS, and, uh, and you should be able to do the assignment now. You've seen all the material uh, for Chapter 5. And so the assignment's due on um, Friday and the quiz next Monday. So uh, you'll want to get those things done as soon as possible so that you can get ready for the exam um, next week.